Hebrews chapter 4 this morning with me. Hebrews. Verse number 13, Hebrews 4.13. The apostle, whoever wrote this, some say Paul, and I tend to agree with that. We can't prove it one way or another, but in Hebrews chapter number 4, verse 13, the scripture says, Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. All things are naked and open to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Lord, anoint your word, anoint, anoint the messenger. In thy name I pray, amen. You can be seated. The apostle gives an argument leading up to the last part of this in the book of Hebrews chapter number 4 about rest, about the rest of God. And this is, this, is, this is something that if you get a hold of this this morning, it will help you a great deal about the Sabbath and so forth. These people were keeping the Sabbath day. It's very clear. In another place, he talks about the Sabbath, he says. The Sabbath day. They had no rest. Amen. Had no rest. Rest is not in a day. Rest is in a person. Amen. He is our rest. One man esteemeth one day above another. Let every man be fully persuaded in his own mind. If a man is, preaches and observes the, 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 the real Sabbath, Saturday, I'm not going to argue with a man and get into a big thing with that. No, sir. No, sir. I respect what someone else may believe. But for me, I know that uh, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, there is no difference. He's the Lord of every single day, and our rest is in a person and not in a day. But the apostle makes some arguments that lead up to this last point. See, so he says in verse 12, the word of God is quick and powerful and sharp than any two-edged sword. It's a living thing. The word of God uh, penetrates to the very heart of an individual. This is why so many people are uncomfortable when you start pre preaching the word of God because it goes deeper than the intellect. It reaches into the heart. And if you've ever read the Word of God on your own, you realize that you're a hold of something that's a lot bigger than you are. Amen. How many ever felt that? Yeah. You're reading something that's much bigger than a human being. God may have used men to pin the words down, but holy men of God spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. All scriptures given by inspiration from God. Theos Neustos. God breathed this holy book. Thank God for that. I've, I've staked my life, my soul, my future, my fortune, everything I ever hoped to be on this blessed book right here. Amen. I believe the Bible. You're not going to come to Temple Baptist Church and hear me up here correcting it every time you turn around, walk out wondering what God said. If you've got a King James Bible in your hand, folks, believe it. Read it and believe it. You'll be amazed at what a difference it'll make. But in any event, he said then... He said that everything is open to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. And it is. God knows all things. And neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight. In plain words, he's laying the foundation for you to understand that you can come to God just as you are because he already knows all about you. He says, first of all, that his word is going to penetrate to your soul and naked and open to the eyes of him with whom we have to do. He can see everything that you are. And so many people get the idea from Satan because he'll beat you to death with it that you're a hypocrite. That you're not living the kind of life where God will hear what you say. Let me tell you something. Until you start listening from God and listening to the Lord and hearing something from God, you can't half live a life that's going to be pleasing to God. Your strength is going to come from the Lord. This is that communication with God that's going to change you. We exhaust our abilities. We mean well. We try hard. And, and I'm sure that's a noble thought. But the truth of the matter is, you cannot produce, generate anything spiritual. It's got to come from God. And the first source, number one, the first source of anything spiritual in your life is that book. The Bible. The Bible. Then the Holy Ghost. 
opening up the pages of the Bible and writing them in your heart, then won't you hear from God what He says about you? Then you can act upon it. Now let's go through it again. The Word of God is quick and powerful, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. God speaks to you through His Word. But then the Bible said all things are naked and open to the eyes of Him with whom we have to do. You understand that He can see everything you've done. You cannot hide anywhere from God. That settled. Now look what he says. Verse 14. Seeing then that we have a high priest that is passed into the heavens, a great high priest, Jesus the Son of God, he's the only one. Let us hold fast our profession. Now watch this. He's, he's, he's summarizing this. He's coming to a point. He laid the foundation for the point. Now he's going to come to the point. For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. That word touched, my dear friend, literally means feel. He can feel what you feel. Amen. And you say, well, I'm going through something and I wish God could feel it and understand because I'm just a mortal human being on this earth. He does. The Lord Jesus Christ is a high priest that feels what you feel. And then look at verse number 16. Here's the product, the end product of all of it. This is why it is so necessary to understand. He sees you in His Word. He sees you from heaven. He knows our frame that we're but dust. He knows everything there is to know about us. And in spite of all of that, He invites you to come. Verse number 16. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Amen. If we only knew how much we need God. Amen. If we only knew how much we need Him. If we only knew how short we come when we try to please Him in the flesh or with natural ability and mean well. And folks, they do mean well. And they're trying to please God. But without faith, Hebrews chapter number 11, it is poss impossible to please Him. For He that cometh to God... You want to come to the Lord? He that cometh to God must believe that He is. And that He is rewarder of them that diligently search or seek for Him. I want you to notice what's in verse 16. This is a beautiful thing. It's an invitation. Let us therefore come. The Bible is full of invitations. It even ends with an invitation. Isn't that a wonderful thing? God invites us. All through the scripture, come, he says. Come. Well, preacher, I'm not worthy. He didn't tell you to be worthy. Well, preacher, I've sinned. That's the, what this is about. Well, preacher, you know, I don't know if I really mean it today. That's not the issue. The issue is that you act upon what the word of God is doing in your heart right now at this moment. Satan will let you live for tomorrow. Or Satan will put you in the past. He'll never let you live when God's Spirit is moving in your heart and in your soul. It is here. It is now. It is today. Today, he said, right now, to do something about this message from God. So the invitation, let us come boldly. That word boldly is the Greek preposition meta. It's all over the Bible. It has to do with what's in context. What are we talking about? That's what the preposition is attached to. Come boldly. Boldly, because God sees all things. Come with confidence, because you know the invitation is irregardless of who you are, what you've done, or what you're capable of doing. That's the only way that you can get right with God, is to take God at His Word. Don't try to figure it out. He that spared not His own Son, but freely offered Him up for us, how shall He not freely with Him give us all things? God proved what He thought about you when the Lord Jesus went to the cross at Calvary. Amen. So in Hebrews chapter number 4 verse 16, let us therefore come. Notice the two things that are important about this. He says that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. When you come to Him, you're going to find mercy. Hallelujah for mercy. I want mercy, not justice. If you want, you can have justice. I want mercy. I want mercy from God. 
And so He gives you a throne of mercy and a throne of grace. In this age you have a high priest that ministers grace to the believers. Were not His words gracious, they said, when the Lord Jesus was here preaching the Word of God. He is a gracious message because He's a gracious God. He, my friend, would have every reason, every right to cast us all into oblivion. But that's not what He wants to do with you. He wants to take you from the dunghill and He wants to put you at a table that is in the presence of the Son of God and He wants to pour out a blessing on you that you can't contain. But in the process from the dunghill to the presence of God, He's not going to play with you as the big daddy up in the sky that's just going to kiss you and bless you and take care of you like you hear the preaching today. He is going to transform you from a child of hell into a child of God and He's going to do it by the power of the Holy Spirit of God so that when you leave this world, the transition from this world to that world will be right in the sight of God. Amen. He that hath begun a good work in you will perform it till the day of Jesus Christ. Mercy is the manner in which it is given. Given by mercy. Grace is the means whereby we are helped. In plain words, it is grace that gives you what you need from God. Grace hands you forgiveness. Grace gives you strength. Grace increases your faith. Grace has that fellowship with you that God wants dearly. And we don't want it near as much as He does. So He said, let us come to a throne of grace. Now there are other thrones in the Bible. Let me read some of them for you. Because the throne of grace is a wonderful, marvelous thing. But there are thrones in the Bible that I wouldn't want to be at. Ezekiel chapter number 1 verse 26. There's a moving throne where God comes to his people through the prophet Ezekiel and lets them know that even then, this is what we call one of the captivity prophets. They're in the captivity in the book of Ezekiel and he wants them to know that even though Babylon and Assyria has taken them captive, Jehovah is still God. Nothing has changed about that. And listen, they're taking America captive too right now. But the Lord Jesus Christ is still God. Nothing has changed about Him. Presidents come, presidents go. Political parties come, political parties go. Caesar's here, Caesar's there. But render to God that which is God and to Caesar that which is Caesar. Never forget, I don't care how good Caesar looks, he's still Caesar. Amen. Amen. And the only one that I worship. And that's the one seated on the throne of grace. Daniel chapter number 9. He said, I beheld the thrones were cast down and the ancient of days did sit. Ancient of days has to do with life span on this earth with mankind. Because ancient has nothing to do with eternity. It has to do with the beginning of something to the end of something. And my dear friend, he is from everlasting to everlasting. And he sits down on a throne and he judges all of mankind from the first Adam until the last human being that will ever be born. They'll all come before that throne. Why? Because he's the giver of life. And they exist because he exists. Have you learned that lesson yet? Do you know that yet? That you're alive because he's alive. Do you know that you're existing because he brought you into existence? Have you ever really looked into the face of God and said, Thank you, Lord, because I live, that I exist, that I'm here because he gave you that life. Matthew 19, 28, he said to them, they said, Which of you followed me in the regeneration of the Son of Man shall sit in the throne of his glory? Ye shall sit upon twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Here's another throne. What is this one? This is the throne that is in Jerusalem. And the twelve tribes of Israel are judging the earth. And my dear friend, he is sitting in glory. It is glory for men to see. This is why what happens in the millennium is so strict. Because you can see the Son of God sitting in Jerusalem with His glory all around Him. Amen. My dear friend, when you have that kind of privilege, then you have an accountability. Luke 22 verse 30, You may eat and drink at my table in my kingdom, but sit on thrones judging the twelve tribes of Israel. Then in Revelation chapter number 20 and verse 11, He talks about a great white throne. That's where you don't want to be. But the fact of the matter is, you will be as a witness. All of the little babies, 60 million of them that have been murdered in this country, that'll be their day in court. 
It'll be their voice. It'll be their time to face their killers. And I don't want to be, I would not want to be at the great white throne judgment with the blood of little children dripping from my hands. Would you? Because they will give an account. Do you realize that they've got technology now? That it's so good. This thing with CRISPR-Cas9 and the technology they have with gene editing and all of that. They can project what your child would have looked like that you had aborted. And when you aborted it, you really didn't see anything, you know, unless they showed you the little baby. They can show you what that child would look like when it was 20 years old. Think about it for a moment. How many of you would kill a 20-year-old child? That's what you're killing when you kill a baby in its mother's womb. Technology's catching up with God. They'll never catch him, but they're beginning to understand the majesty and the greatness of Almighty God. It was programmed into your genes before you were ever born what you would look like. But what you look like now, looking at me through those eyes and watching me up here this morning, is your soul. And the expression that's on your face is totally and completely controlled by your soul. You can have two human beings that are completely identical. And you couldn't tell one from the other except for their soul. Because they will never look the same. There is not another, nor will there ever be, another soul like you. You are unique. You're an individual. Isn't that something? God made you the way you are. If you've been born again, there's something in the soul that lets somebody else know that you're born again. But if you're not, that'll also do the same thing. So we have need. You know what you need? The Bible said, come. The scripture says in the book of, of uh, Peter, call unto me, in John, call unto me and I'll answer thee and show thee great and mighty things that thou knowest not. But Peter, the Bible said, was when he was locked up in the book of Acts, they'd taken him and cast him into a dungeon. The scripture says that prayer was made without ceasing for Peter. The early church knew something we don't know today. They knew that they got on their face and they began to cry out to God. And they cried 24-7, 12, 12 months out of the, however long it took for them to know that they had gotten an answer from the Lord. Have you ever prayed like that? You know the importunate woman it talks about in the Gospels? She kept coming back to the judge. She kept coming back to the judge. And the judge said, if I don't do something, this woman's going to wear me out. He could not turn her off. You know why? Because she believed in him and knew him. Aren't you glad that when you keep coming back and you keep coming back and you keep... He can't turn you off? Because you're bone of his bone and flesh of his flesh? You realize that you belong to the Lord? Have you ever wanted God to answer a prayer? Enough. To where you would pray without ceasing. Have you ever gotten away from people. And got out alone somewhere. And started crying out to God. With my friend with fervency. The effectual fervent prayer. Of a righteous man. Availeth much. Have you ever done that? Have you ever prayed like that? Have you ever been somewhere where you're not going to. You're not going to. You're not going to be satisfied. Would you get an answer? You know, we thank the Lord for the doctors and the nurses and the hospitals and the technology and all that. Thank God for it. I'll never preach against medical science. But let me tell you who does the healing. In Exodus chapter 15 verse 26, he said, I am the Lord that healeth thee. Have you been given a death sentence by a doctor? Well, the doctor's telling you what he can do physically. He's telling you what a human being is capable of. But there is one who makes the final call. And it's not the doctor. Why don't you call unto him that can answer you and show you great and mighty things that you know not. Let your prayer ascend into the presence of Almighty God. The book of Romans chapter number 8 says that we know not what we should pray for as we ought. That ought to humble every one of us. We ought to really be humbled with that. We should say to ourselves, Lord, I know what I think I need. Lord, I know who I love. Lord, I know I, have, I want you to answer my prayer. But when you come down to the very nitty gritty of it, you really don't know what to pray. You really don't know how to pour your heart out to God. But thanks be to God, in Romans chapter number 8, he said, But the Holy Ghost, 
the Holy Spirit maketh intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. That is God speaking to God on your behalf. That doesn't get any better than that. Amen. Christ in the garden of Gethsemane prayed as it were great drops of blood. Have you ever prayed that hard? He did. And of course, when you look at what he was praying about, you can understand. Great drops of blood. He poured his soul out to the Lord. Fill your mind with the Lord Jesus. Fanny Crosby said, I think of him all the day long. And she said, I will see him face to face. Yet my friend, she was blind in this world. But she loved him. And she thought of him all day long. Do you? Do you think about the Lord Jesus all day long? All the time? The Bible says he is our life. The Bible said in him we move and live and have our being. The Lord Jesus Christ is not somebody you come in here on Sunday and talk about and pray to. And then you know get real pious on one day of the week. And then you hang him at the door when you walk out and say I'll pick you up when I need you. And next time I come to church well we'll put you back on again. And a lot of people are like that. Don't let that man think that he could ever receive anything from God. Cry out to him 24-7. About 30 years ago, 35 years ago, I had a soul come to me. And she said, Preacher, she says, I just got back from the mountains. I said, you did? Yes. She says, I go up there to pray. I go up there and I park my car and I walk out into the woods. And I get out there between me and God and I pray. I like to pray outside, she said. Have you ever done that? This building is man-made. There's nothing wrong with this building. It's here. We need it. God doesn't need it. We do. We're the ones that get cold. We get wet. You see, he doesn't need the building. It's for us. <laughs> but anyway, have you ever gone outside when there's nothing over your head? And have you cried out to God and have you seen the difference? How many have? Next time that you don't feel like praying, go out and pray. Get out of the house. Go out in the woods somewhere. Get alone with God and talk to the Lord. Have you ever had a season of prayer? Your body, your spirit, your soul goes through cycles. It goes through seasons. You're not always as spiritual as you think you are. You're not always shouting on top of the mountain. I wish we could. I wish we could get saved, get up on top of the mountain, shout it on out all the way to glory. Amen. Have visions and visitations and all kinds. That'd be wonderful, wouldn't it? But life's not like that. The Christian life has all kinds of problems. But you go through cycles. Have you ever noticed how you get yourself into a time, you, may not have, you might not have even had anything to do with it, but, but you're beginning to think about spiritual things. They're beginning to move in your heart. Well, let me tell you what it is. God, you're going through a cycle. It's an amazing how you can do this when God begins to move in your heart. We used to, move in, we used to meet in the nursery back here in the back. We'd gather in there for prayer. I said one day, years ago, I said, Next Sunday night, I'm going to meet back there in that nursery before service. And so I went back there the next Sunday night, and my goodness, we had 15 or 20 men show up in there. And at first, it went real good. We just met back there and shut the door and got out on our knees and started praying. Just got in there and got together and started praying. But then it started to morph. It started to change. Go in there, and this one had something to say, and that one had something to say, and this one had something to say. First thing you know, it devolved into a talking session with not much pray. And I, I, I only stood that for a while. And I said, Lord, what's the point in us going back there and going through that? And then sometimes you go back there and go through that, and you're mad when you get up here to preach. <laughs> that doesn't help anything, does it? Amen. So I said one day, enough of this. Enough of it. Enough of it. So I stopped. And we haven't missed it. Because we still got praying people in here. Well, yes, we do. I uh, remember preaching some revival meetings where some people, a preacher came to me one time and he said, Preacher, he said, I don't know if you know this or not. He said, but the whole time you were up there preaching, there was a man in the basement underneath you praying. He prayed the whole service. While you preached, he prayed. But he didn't want anybody to know about it. And the only reason you're knowing about it is because I knew about it. And I told you because he wouldn't tell you. He didn't want any recognition for it. He was down there praying while you were preaching. And we had good services. Holy Ghost moved. 
I remember when he got out and he prayed. I remember a revival meeting where I went into a church. It's up here in Morristown. This is about 20, 25 years ago. Went in to preach. And when I got in there and got up in the pulpit and started preaching, you wouldn't believe it. They were tossing their babies back and forth. I mean, they spent all that time playing with their babies and no time listening to the preaching. They're not all like that. I'm glad, thank God. But we didn't have much of a meeting. There was no spirit in there. It was dead. I remember a revival meeting I preached in Roanoke, Alabama. How, there, how many has ever been down to a place like that in Alabama? Good people. Good people. They loved the Lord. We had a good revival in Roanoke, Alabama. But I was introduced to somebody down there that I've never forgotten about. They took me up to him and I said, I want you to meet this brother right here. Said, everybody in this church comes to him with their prayer request because he prays. This man prays hours a day. He's a prayer warrior. He prays. He calls up. He calls unto the Lord. Oh, I met him. I put my hand out and I said, brother, it's so nice to meet you. And when I looked at his face and listened to his spirit, it was the sweetest, gentlest spirit that I've been around in a long time coming forth from this man. You see, this man had been in the presence of God. He spent time with the Lord and he couldn't help but show other people when this happened. He was, I'm, I'm glad of all the places I've been and the revivals that I've preached, I'll never forget that man. There was something special about him. He prayed and everybody knew it. And he was. I preached revival in a church where they made a lot of noise one time. What do you mean noise? I mean clankety clank noise. I sat down and I thought, well, Lord of mercy, what's going on here? They played, they banged, they, they clanged, they, they went on, and they just went on and they went on and they went on, they went on, they went on. Then when they got done banging and clanging, said, now preacher so-and-so can come up and preach. And here I went up. And I got up there in that pulpit, and it was twice dead and plucked up by the roots. Even though they said amen, they said amen, and they said amen. I could tell that there was a spirit among those people of self-righteousness. They had put on their performance, their worship service. They felt good about themselves. The fact is, they were full of themselves. And by being full of themselves, they, my dear friend, had destroyed everything that had power. And I'm going to tell you one more revival I went to. One more. I preached a revival meeting in Newport, Tennessee. And this was unique. I never preached another one like it. Newport, Tennessee. This pastor invited me up. So I, this is back. Now, folks, remember, I'm back. I'm young. <laughs> I could, I, I turn, I've turned a lot of revivals down. Don't preach them anymore. I can't. It's all I can do to handle what i got going on here. But I went up there to Newport. And I got up in the pulpit and I preached. Day one. They all came in day two. I'm not exaggerating. The Lord's my witness. Day three. Day four. They started moving. I could see a tear. They started receiving what I said. Guard was like, they, they lowered their guard. They started accepting, you know, what those people were doing. They wanted to see if I was real before they wanted to hear anything I had to say. They're just, they're just folks up there in the mountains in Newport, Tennessee, and we had a good revival. But it took three days of just sitting there looking at me. And I thought to myself on day four, I told, I told my wife, I said, I don't know, man, if there's any use in going back. But day four, it began to break. And thank God for it, because it was a good revival. It's always good when people are genuine and real. And something comes out of the soul. Amen. Now, why don't you? Why don't you get revived? Will you say, Preacher, I'm waiting for an official announcement. Yeah. Yeah. Every church in East Tennessee has a spring revival and a fall revival. I don't know what's wrong with a summer revival and a winter revival. I mean, they've planned it, they've scheduled it, and they meet and they go through their formality, and then when it's over, it's over, and then they're planning for the next one. They didn't have a revival. 
That's not a revival. We could have a revival in here right now. Right now. Right now. We just passed November, uh, June the 6th, D-Day. You all know what that is, D-Day. I have nothing but the greatest respect for the courage of those young men. Respect them, man. I respect them. D-Day, December the, the uh, 6th, 1944. What happens this? When 150,000, 200,000 troops finally got into Europe, they began to move toward Nazi Germany. And Hitler knew it. They moved across France. They moved across Belgium. They moved across all they needed to move across to get to Berlin. They were headed for Nazi Germany. Hitler did something that the Allies did not expect. He took all of his resources, all that he had left, and he, he called a counteroffensive. He came back against the American troops and the Allies. They didn't expect it, and because they didn't expect it, he was able to penetrate the American line and push it back and created what's called a big bulge. How many's heard of the Battle of the Bulge? That's what it is. It's that. When Hitler had pushed them back, there was a place there called Bastogne. And it was part of what Hitler had taken. He'd surrounded Bastogne. He'd surrounded it. And the American commander in there was given an ultimatum. You surrender. You know, we treat you as a prisoner of war. And you come on. The American commander, I forget, I don't remember his name, I don't know if he was a colonel or a general, but the American commander sent back nuts. <laughs> now, Germans are smart people, but they looked at each other and said, what do you mean, nuts? What does that mean? Well, if you've been an American, you'd known what nuts meant. You know, there's some words you can use to describe what he meant. Here's the bottom line. They called Patton. They called for Patton to come up and help them at Bastogne. Patton was a tank commander and they couldn't have called upon a better one. And here he came. He came to deliver the troops that were at Bastogne. But while they had penetrated the American line, pushed it back, they took our boys captive at a place called Marmody. Write that down, Marmody. They took our boys captive and then they executed them. They murdered them. That's called a war crime. And later on, our troops found their dead bodies in the ground. So what's that got to do with me, preacher? It's got everything to do with you. If you begin to take back ground that Satan has moved in on, if you begin to get something good back in your life, he's got a he takes what's called a stronghold upon you. You begin to push back against it and say, Satan, you can't have my life. You can't have me. I've listened long enough to you. And you begin to cry out to God. God will send you somebody like Patton. A spiritual Patton. And when he sends you that, He's going to send you that to take back that which is rightfully belonging to the Lord Jesus Christ. Let me warn you. If you get serious today to get serious with God, you're going to face a battle. But I'm not trying to discourage you. I'm trying to tell you what the real world's like. This is Father's Day. My little girl sitting back there, she'll be 50 years old December the 18th. So what's that make me? She'll be 50. My oldest granddaughter, 26 in August. I'm getting old and cold. <laughs> but I've been her father ever since she's been in this world. She's never known another dad. I've been there. I've loved my little girl from day one. And I'm proud to be a father. It's an honorable thing. It's a good thing. If you know anything about me, you know I never had one. My grandfather raised me. He was born in 1878. When he was born, Jesse James was still robbing banks and trains. That's how far back we go. But if you're in here at the day of father, 
What kind of spirit do you have in your family? You should be the head, the leader in that house. You should be like that Old Testament priesthood. You should be the one setting the example. You should be one that's saying to the family, let's go to church. Mom and children. That's what fathers do. That's what a real father does. So if you could do nothing better today for Father's Day than to do that, to come and give your life back to the Lord if you need to, may not need to. I don't know what your spiritual condition is. We don't put numbers. You don't see any numbers on that wall back there. You never will. We don't go out here and brag about this or that. Numbers has nothing to do with what's going on in the house of God. But would you like to come today, Father, since it's Father's Day? If you need to come and say, Lord, I want you to make me a better father. My children are watching me. I love my children. I love them more than I love myself. I love my children. I love my family. I love my wife. I love my home. That's the foundation of this society. That's the foundation of civility. That's the foundation of living in a world that's fit to live in. Husbands and wives and children. Father, in Jesus' name. I pray you'd use what I've said this morning. Speak to all the fathers in the house. We just had Mother's Day not too long ago. Praise God for a blessed mother. Praise God for a good, godly mother. Thank you, Lord, for that. Hallelujah. Now it's Father's Day. If we have fathers in here this morning, Lord, that they want to come and they want to say, Lord, make me a better father. Make me a better father. I don't want my children to miss out. I don't want them to be harmed or hurt because I've failed them. Make me a better father. I pray that in Jesus' name, Lord, that will give, give glory and honor to thy holy name. In Jesus' name.